Now we're moving into Hebrews chapter 8. And I'm excited about kind of this culmination of a, what has been a four chapter uh, sweep through this idea, this thought of Jesus being the great high priest. Okay, we're going we're gonna to put a bow on it, even though we'll talk about it more in the coming weeks. The author of Hebrews kind of puts a bow on this thought that we have this great high priest. And so today we're, we're kind of labeling things as this. We have Jesus. Because I love how chapter 8 starts. It starts in this way. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest. <laughs> so it's almost like he's just been building up this argument like, this is kind of who the priest is and what the priesthood is like and his ministry and all that. And we'll, we'll unpack that as we go, but it just kind of culminates. This is the apex of it here at the beginning of chapter 8. Finally, we get to the point of it all, okay? And so I was thinking of it in terms of this. Have you, have you ever been told a story? Okay, so you're, you're in a conversation, you're listening to somebody and they're, they're telling you a story. And this story is so captivating, but it's... So hard to keep up with the details of it because of its length and its depth, all right? So sometimes we're talking to somebody who just loves to communicate and loves to talk and they love to talk your ear off, but they're telling us a captivating story, but we're kind of getting lost in the details of it. So we're almost like at times like, hey, slow down. And eventually what we want them to do is do what? Get to the point of it, right? Like, hey, what, what's your point here? And sometimes the person will even say, hey, this is the point of this. I love that. I love when people give me the point of things. I like things being clear. I, I don't like gray areas so much in storytelling, right? I want to I get to the what's behind it. What's the gist of this? I'm a sucker for a summary. That's why I love Wikipedia. You guys love Wikipedia? Love it, right? Uh, like if you look at my internet search history, it has the most random Wikipedia searches, right? Like I, I was thinking about one the other day, Jason Alexander. I Wikipedia'd that guy. Does anybody know who that is? George Costanza from, from Seinfeld. Right? I was just like, hey, what's this guy doing now? What's he up to, right? Man, I learned some really cool things about Jason Alexander the other day. That he's been married to the same woman. This is what stood out to me more than anything. He's been married to the same woman since 1982. But you didn't know that, right? George Costanza, the guy that had a hard time getting a woman on Seinfeld, right? Has had the same woman for 41 years now. It's just amazing. So I, I Wikipedia the most random things, but I love it because I love history, I love information, I love learning things, and Wikipedia a lot of times does what? It kind of gives us the Cliff's Notes version of things. It gives us the synopsis. It gives us the point of things, the main point. And this is exactly what the author does here in chapter 8 of Hebrews. After this lengthy and wordy discourse... With tons of specifics and information, he gets us to the point. And it reveals one massive truth, especially there in verse 1, that we have Jesus. So that is our main idea today. We have Jesus who is presented to us in divine majesty with a divine ministry. So we have Jesus who is presented to us in divine majesty and with a divine ministry. Those are going to be kind of the two thoughts that we unpack. So let me pray, and then we'll jump in and move here. God, I, I praise you for this morning. I praise you for your work in our lives. I praise you for your work over this church. I praise you for how much you love us, how faithful you are to us. You are a good, good God that we got to sing about this morning, and now we get to celebrate your goodness through your word, God, as we're reminded of your son, Father, and how he is the great high priest, how he's the only one that we need. Lord, would you cause us to hunger so much more for you this morning through these words. Change our lives. Change our hearts. Draw us to repentance, challenge us, encourage us, bring us to joy this morning as we learn that we have all that we need in Jesus. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we have Jesus who is presented to us in divine majesty with a divine ministry. So look at, let's look at divine majesty first. Verse 1 again. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest. One who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. And I just love how chapter 8 begins because it begins with this. Now, here's the point. Like, I love that. 
I'm going to give you the point now because there's been a lot of information and it's been easy to kind of get lost in the details over the last few chapters. So why is this significant? Well, it's significant for that reason. That a lot has been said over the past few chapters, really since chapter 4, describing this type of priest. Describing the type of uh, priest that Christ is. That he's the great high priest in chapter 4, verse 14. We were introduced to that. And then we've learned about the type of priesthood that Christ comes from. After the order of Melchizedek. So we've learned a lot about Melchizedek. This random kind of priest king. He's not so random because he points us to Jesus, the greater priest king. And we learn about him in Genesis. And Hebrews just keeps bringing us back to this Melchizedek who didn't come from Israel. All right. So kind of pointing out that Jesus, although he did come from Israel, he was still God. All right. So, yeah, he was terrestrial in many ways, but he was extraterrestrial because he's God. He's not from here. He created everything. He laid the foundations of everything, as Hebrews chapter one tells us. So this priesthood has been described in great detail over the last few chapters. It's been described as eternal, confirmed with an oath, initiated not by legal appointment or tribal qualification, untouched by death. I love that line in chapter 7 verse 16 that he has the power of an indestructible life. We've learned that that uh, this priesthood uh, is as a once for all sacrifice. It's better than the law. It's so pure that it has no need for a sin offering and it's a better covenant and guarantee. That's what we learned last week. So for four chapters, we've been given a lot of info, a lot of specifics, a lot of details, a thorough breakdown of this great high priest and this great high priesthood. And the excitement has been building. And now it reaches, like I told you, its apex. It culminates here with this statement. Like now the point of all this is this, that we have such a high priest in verse 1. This is the point of all the detail. Jesus is the high priest and church, we have him. We don't have to go searching for him. We don't have to go looking anywhere else. He's there. He's the mediator. He's the great sacrifice. He is our salvation. And to the author, this seems almost unbelievable. It's unbelievable to the author. He just, he's just so excited. You can see the excitement jumping off the page, all right? How excited he is that we have such a high priest. It's like when I landed my wife. I'm telling you, man, it's surprising. It's shocking that this woman married me, all right? And we've been married for a long time now. It, and it, it does. It surprises me. It should surprise you. It should be a head scratcher, all right? How could Aaron get Ashley? Ashley Harris, the Southwestern Virginian, who can do anything and everything. Better than me, by the way. And probably better than you, too. She's that good. This, this author is just so incredibly like, amazed and astonished, almost bewildered, but just so pumped that we have such a high priest. It's like he's, his mind through the Holy Spirit is kind of rifling through the entire Old Testament and all the Old Testament scriptures and how all of them point to this great high priest who we have, and it's Jesus, who he just mentioned his name of in chapter 7, verse 22. We have Jesus. So for seven chapters, really for four chapters, but really for seven chapters... We've been told what we need. We've been told what we need. Somebody that's more superior. Superior than the prophets. Superior than the angels. Superior than Moses. Superior than all the high priests that came before. And here now, we're, we, we're being told that we've got what we need. This is it. Like, we don't have to look any further. This is where we're told that no matter where we're at in our lives, no matter how much we think we've screwed up, no matter how much we think that things are hopeless, this is where we're given the hope. We have such a high priest. And that nothing matters more than this. That we know the solution to our greatest problem. Because we've been talking about if we're going to be pointed to the law... And if we're going to be pointed to the priesthood, then we have to know that both of those things exist to expose our sin. That the law lays heavy demands upon every single man, woman, and child that has ever lived and ever will live. 
And that the priesthood served to kind of be an intermediary to a certain degree, but really, like we're going to see this morning, a copy and a shadow, useful to point God's people and mankind to this greater priest, this more superior priest. I love it. He's the one. And this just isn't the point of Hebrews. That's why I'm so excited about it. This is the point of all of Scripture. And this is the point of everything. So, you know, you could be here this morning, and I don't know where everybody's coming from in your life. The struggles, the deep struggles, the hardship, the, the, the cultural background, the religious background. But I know that whatever you brought in here this morning and whoever you are, that your greatest need can be met in Jesus and found in Jesus. That's the point of this. That's what our attention is being brought to. This is the point of Hebrews. This is the point of everything. This is the point of life. So let's not miss the forest for the trees, even though the Jews historically had and even still many have, it's tragic, it's sad. But it'd be like visiting the Grand Canyon, if any of you have ever visited the Grand Canyon. And it's kind of ugly, the terrain around the Grand Canyon. In parts, there's a little bit of greenery. But for the most part, it's, it's pretty ugly. But then you see the Grand Canyon in all of its massivity and its profoundness. And you can't believe that it's there. But it'd be like visiting the Grand Canyon in all of its glory, historical glory... And just looking at all the deserty ter terrain and ugly terrain around it. And that's what happens. We somehow, Jews have done it historically, and then humankind somehow walks through these lives, even though it's built within our consciences, that we were made for the glory of God, each and every human being, and we miss him. We miss him. We somehow think that a career pursuit or a relationship or some hobby or whatever it may be can actually fill that empty void in our lives. And the author of Hebrews is like, no, that's ridiculous. We have Jesus. And he's the one that you need. And he's the solution to your greatest need and needs. And so Jesus is the one in verse 1. He's the one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Man, don't move past that statement quickly. Like sit in that for just a moment, church. He is the one who is seated. All other high priests, guess what, guess what they did when they offered sacrifices? They stood. They stood. So we're being told here again how much better Jesus is. He's sitting. He's like, I got this, guys. I'm going to go ahead and sit down on my throne. All right? The sacrifice has been offered. Nothing else needs to be done. He's seated at the highest place imaginable. The throne of the majesty in heaven... He is no terrestrial high priest who hails from Levi and needs a savior himself. No. no. This is the extraterrestrial, divine, glorious, great high priest. He is different. He is built differently. He is of divine essence is what this verse tells us. He's of the majesty in heaven. Majesty, you know what it means? Pretty simple. Greatness. So anytime you say, hey, that is majestic, you're saying, that is great. We use great more than majestic. Majestic's a really powerful word, though. <laughs> so the English translators used a, very, a much more powerful word than even the word great. But greatness gives you an idea. He's the most greatest <laughs> because he's God. He sits on a throne, the right hand of the Father, in heaven, he by nature holds an exalted position because in ancient culture, the right hand was only ever reserved for the most powerfully prestigious noble of all the nobles. And so what's being communicated here is that there is no more exalted position than the one 
that Jesus holds. He is on the throne. He's on the throne in heaven. He's on the throne of earth. And guess what? He's on the throne of your life. And you might not want him to be, or you might think he's a bad king. He's not, because he went to the cross for you. So, argument done, stamped. <laughs> like, he hasn't been good to me, Aaron. You know, my life has not turned out the way that I really wanted it to. Yeah, I know. I get it. He can empathize with that, though. Hebrews told us that. But sometimes we overlook our greatest need, our greatest problem, when we're talking about all of our other issues in life. Broken relationships, our addictions, our vices, whatever it may be. The, the career path that didn't work out for us, the broken friendships, all the hardship. We kind of focus on that and we attribute God's lack of goodness to those things. And we overlook the fact that he went to a cross for our sins. So literally everything else could go bad in my life. But if I am saved from my sins, then I have everything that I need. Now that's not popular. And you wanted to hear more. You wanted me to get real prosperity with you. Because you're like, man, Aaron, you've already told us that fasting like really changes things. Hey, it does, by the way. It does. But listen, God is concerned about all the details of your life, all the hardship, all the things that you're going through. He's most concerned about your soul, your eternity, and getting you back, restoring you back to the place that you were intended to be, which was a child of his. You're already created by him, so you can't get around that. You can say that you're random, but you're not. You are special. You are uniquely made. You can try to get around it. You can try to explain your way through it through science. But I'll tell you that science points to it. But so not only has he created you, you are an image bearer, all of you. Whether you're an atheist or a Christian, all of you are image bearers of God. He doesn't want you to just be a creation. He wants you to be recreated. He wants you to be reborn, renewed. He wants you to be his child. That's the whole point of this priesthood. Is that God wants to be in relationship with all of you. Every single one of you. So. Not only does he hold. And this kind of leads us into this next thought. Not only does he hold this exalted position. But he also holds an exalted function. He's creator, but he's also sustainer. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 tells us that, that he holds all things together. <laughs> That's important. He doesn't create and then go hands off. He creates and he sustains, which means he's not idle in his exaltedness. He's not just sitting on that throne and like, okay, guys, good luck. Figure it out. I hope it goes okay for you. When you do something good, I'll celebrate you. When you do something weird... I'll be like, how dare you? What are you thinking? What's your problem? Right? That's not him. He is not an idle king. He's not lazy. He's moving. He's working. He's renewing. He's making all things new. He's currently doing that. He'll bring it all to fulfillment and completion. That's what Revelation 21 teaches us. He's not a lazy king who abuses his authority by making everyone else do the dirty work. He also has a powerfully active, ongoing divine ministry as high priest. So it makes me think about this quote by Keller. He said this, as things are brought back under Christ's rule and authority, which by the way, that's what's happening. That's what's in process since Calvary, since he came out of that empty tomb. So as things are brought back under Christ's rule and authority, they are restored to health, beauty, and freedom. I love that. I mean, spiritual health, right? Like there's, there's ways for us to get physically healthy. There's ways for us to get mentally healthy. There's ways for us to get emotionally healthy. So health in every way imaginable here, Keller's kind of referring to. Spiritual health is the most important. Beauty, being able to live in the view of God's glory. That's a beautiful life. Living in the view through the lens of God's glory. That's a beautiful life. Seeing everything around us as gift 
not gain. That's the message of Ecclesiastes, which we'll, go, we'll walk through Ecclesiastes a little bit later on in the year. Seeing life through a lens of gift, not gain. That is a good definition for a beautiful life. And then freedom. Oh my goodness. Does God want us to operate in freedom? We are enslaved to everything. If we're not saved, we're enslaved to our sin. If we're saved, then we're enslaved to the propensity to want to drift and attach our worth and our value and our identities to anything but God. We're freed from all that. We're free. We're not, we're no longer slaves to sin. Now, if you're a non-believer here, you're a slave to sin. There's no way out of that. You are in captivity. If you're a Christian, then you're free to not be condemned for even the things that you did wrong an hour ago or that you will ever do. God took all of those things, all of your sins to the cross. He wants you to operate in freedom. And the way that we operate in freedom, at least the best way, is to know that we are created by God and now saved by God and that we exist for the glory of God and for the good of others. So therefore that gets me off of myself. I stop navel gazing. I I lift up my head. I see those around me. I see how good God is in this world, how he is active and moving and how he is trying to restore and how he will restore. And how he wants to do that in individual lives. So this is very personal. And we get to operate in freedom in that. Instead of chasing whatever it is we're chasing to find our value in and our worth in and to attaching our identities to or striving or toiling or like, the, like our identities are wrapped up in what I do and how much I do and my achievements and my success and oh, I feel like a failure. That is not you. That is not your identity. That, there is nothing about that that is true about who you are if you are in Christ. Because you have a great high priest who continues to not only sit at the right hand of God, but be the mediator, the the one who intercedes on your behalf. The one who perpetually, constantly sanctifies you, bringing you to glory. He who began a good work will be faithful to complete it on that day. That's what he's doing. That's his ministry. That's verses 2 through 5. A minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. So listen, Jesus' divine ministry is revealed in his high priestly office. He brings together both greatness and humble service. He is exalted eternally as God and as king, but he also came not to be served, but to serve. This is the point that's being made here in verse 2, that he is a minister in the holy places. And the word there for minister is leitergos. And it has public service implications. Like all high priests, their ministry was public. Jesus' ministry was public. It wasn't a secret. I love Habakkuk 2.14. I always think of the postal ways because Kristen always quotes this verse. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Like is there anything secretive about that? That is the most public statement. How public can you get? How much more public can you get than that? His ministry stretches to every corner of the earth. And the knowledge that's being talked about there in Habakkuk, it's knowledge of his glory. And it has everything to do with how Jesus came into the world to save sinners, which likewise makes his ministry personal. Everyone is confronted by his divine ministry every single person that's why every knee will bow and every tongue will confess there is no way getting around it so you might as well confront it now if you're not a christian 
You might as well just be like, oh my goodness, well one day I will have to confront it and then it'll be too late because that's judgment day. So if you're not a Christian, it's like, "Uh uh-oh, maybe I should, it's confronting me. I'm being confronted by this. There's no way around this. I cannot wiggle my way around this. So why don't we just go ahead and dive into that confrontation if we're not saved? And you'll be met with more love and grace and mercy than you could ever imagine. And for those of you who are Christians, you will continue to be met by all the grace, mercy, and love that you could ever imagine. Now let's talk about the holy places for a moment. In the Old Testament, they were reserved only for the high priest. And his supreme function was to open the way of God for men by meeting God in the holiest of places. I might even have a picture of it for you, if if Isaac can throw it up there. So you can see how there was kind of an outer courtyard. Maybe you can't see it. Maybe it won't be there. So there was an outer courtyard, and then you'd go in kind of the holy place, and then the holiest of holies is where only the high priest could enter. To offer sacrifices, not only on behalf of them, because remember, we've been talking about this, that high priest was sinful, so he had to offer a sacrifice for himself, but then after that, for the sins of the people of God. And so this kind of, what, what the author is doing here is he's pointing us to kind of the greater expression, the greater fulfillment of Jesus being the high priest, the great high priest, who went into the holiest of places, And this happened within the innermost part of the tent, like I just said, which became a tabernacle and then eventually the temple. And it served as the temporary meeting place between God and his people while the Israelites wandered in the desert after their exodus from Egypt. And here it is. The point is that Christ is the better tent because the Lord set it up, not man. That's what we see in verse 2. Christ is the literal meeting place between God and man. He is the mediator. He is the go-between. His mediatorial ministry is most effective. And what the high priestly duties do is they give us added insight into Christ's more superior ministry. So now every high priest was appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. That's what verse 2 tells us. But their gifts in themselves weren't sufficient which is why their offerings had to be ongoing. If Christ were like every other priest before him, we're told here, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, verse 3 tells us. He wasn't from the tribe of Levi. Christ came from Judah. All other earthly high priests came from Levi, so they offered gifts according to the law. But Christ fulfilled the law. We learned that last week. They were bound to the law by the law. Christ came to fulfill the law. So his gift or offering mattered the most because it fulfilled all other gifts preceding it. And why was this important? Well, because again, the law existed, came into being to expose our sin and our desperate need for God to be our God and our rescuer. So we needed someone to come and satisfy the demands of the law. And that's who Jesus did. That's what he So the earthly high priest's offerings, their ministries on the whole, they were limited, which is what we see in verse 5. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. They were a taste of the real thing. And this resonated with a mostly Greek-speaking audience and uh, and culture. They would have been familiar with Plato, who thought of this world in terms of two categories, the real and the unreal. And that our world was only a copy and a shadow of the real world. That our world was an imposter. That everything was an imperfect version of a more perfect one. And Plato had a parable describing this ideology. He says this, that our knowledge of this world is like a man in a fire-lit cave who can only see silhouettes of real objects when he looks at the cave walls. So Plato's point It was that we can only ever see the copies or the shadows for what is real because our world is fundamentally flawed. It is imperfect because of sin. Originally it was perfect. Sin tainted it, tarnished it. So now, according to Plato, 
We're all a bunch of pretenders in an imposter world longing for better. And you know what? I have to agree with Plato to a certain degree. That he was right to a certain degree. If we are trying to discover the realist expressions of who we are from anything that this world offers, we will only find inferior, imperfect, or false expressions. So, where are you seeking to find the realist version of you? Because we talk about authenticity a lot. It's like a big major theme and topic in culture. The real you. And it matters. It's important because nobody wants to be a pretender, but we're all, in some ways, pretending. When we're fighting to attach our worth or value in anything else but God. So we have to kind of get to the bottom of this and saying, well, what is it that I'm kind of trying to find my self-worth in? Because a lot of times, if you're like me, you're going to feel like a pretender. So where are you seeking the most realist, most authentic, most genuine version of you? Is it your job, your relationships, your external appearances, your vices, your achievements? What is it? Because in Christ, we have the real thing. And what this does is it brings his intercessory work into clear focus. Not only does he give us access to God, but he gives us access to reality. You want to stop pretending? You want to stop living a fake life? Turn to Jesus. That's where you find the most authentic and genuine expression of you. And that matters. That matters. Nobody wants to be an imposter. And man, how much freedom is it? How much freedom is there to be able to kind of navigate through these difficult lives, but not pretending? Just being who I am. Loved by God because he made me, but loved by God because he saved me. I'm forgiven. God has granted me his mercy. I have hope. He's not done with me. No matter what I'm going through circumstantially, he is going to see me through it. He is in this for my good and his glory. He's not finished with you. No matter where you are, no matter what you've done, he is not finished with you. He loves you. So in him we have the real thing. The earthly priesthood could only serve as a shadow of what was real. The earthly priesthood could not save sinners. Think of this in terms of a buffet, which is full of pretend food. Let's be honest. All right? And you show up to a buffet. I don't really do it anymore. All right? This is like in my 20s. Show up to a buffet like, I got this. I'm going to kill this. I'm so famished. I'm going to crush. I'm going to eat everything. All right, so you do. And then you get that feeling like, oh my goodness, okay, I'm full. Right? My hunger has been satiated. And then what happens after that? Uh-oh. I don't feel good. Your body didn't get what it needed. It got a br bunch of pretend food that wasn't nutritious in any way. So your body actually didn't get the proper fuel that it needed for your hunger to actually be satiated. For your muscles and everything and joints and, and all the kind of innermost parts of your body and your bones and your structure and everything. Your nerves and all, all of it's affected by food. Your blood. It didn't get what it needed. It got something pretend. It got an imposter. And so what does your body do? It freaks out. And then 12 hours later you're feeling empty. Not only empty but like garbage. And this is it. Like we, we kind of walk through these lives and man, what life offers us, especially in Western culture, is a buffet of anything and everything. And we get, a, we get to choose, we get to pick, 
Man, we get to kind of like determine what course we're going to take and what job we're going to have. And man, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy how good we have it from a common grace standpoint. But the problem is, is that we walk through the buffet line of life and we're choosing all these things to fill the empty void that exists within our lives. And we don't fill it with Christ and with the good news that Jesus came to love and save sinners. And we keep repeating this cycle of filling our, our souls with things that will just leave us empty. We get filled up and we feel pretty good for a moment. And then that feeling goes away and we're right back to being empty. And what we're learning here is that the priesthood was like the buffet in some ways. In other ways, yeah, it did, it, it did its job. It served as a copy and a shadow pointing us to the greater high priest, the great high priest, the greater sacrifice. All right, the, the covenant, the one who made the covenant. So we've got to kind of come to terms with this this morning. Because only Jesus can satisfy our deepest needs and longings and hopes. The tent and the tabernacle were important. That's why we're given, even, we even see at the end of verse 5, that Moses was given these instructions by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. God was serious about the tent and the tabernacle because of what it pointed to. That it pointed to its fulfillment, Jesus. But we all have to come to terms with what are we chasing, striving after? What are we seeking that we think is going to meet our greatest longings, needs, desires, and hopes? It is only Jesus. I love this quote by N.T. Wright. When we begin to glimpse the reality of God, the natural reaction is to worship him. That's what happens. You see the trueness and the fullness of who Jesus is and you begin to worship him. Not to have that reaction is a fairly sure sign that we haven't yet really understood who he is or what he's done. That's why we've been challenging the non-believer here this morning quite a bit. Or the believer who is chasing and striving after anything but God right now. And the reminder to you is that, hey, there's something that can fill you full. And his name is Jesus. And he will satisfy you. It's not going to be easy. <laughs> and you'll still feel empty at times. But he will continuously fill you to the brim. With his goodness and his grace and his love. He will do what nothing else can do. Believe that. So we'll close with this. How are you specifically seeing, for you Christians, how are you specifically seeing Jesus' greatness and his humble service in your life right now? And if you're not a Christian, think about how empty your pursuits are leaving you. And trust Christ today to satisfy you in every way. Like make today the day where you become a Christian. <laughs> Don't wait another moment. Like say, Jesus, save me. I repent of my sins. I repent of trusting something else to save me other than you. And you know what? He'll be good to save you. All right? Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you for your love and the hope that we have today. The hope that we've been given. The hope that there is something in this universe that can actually satisfy our deepest longings and needs. God, so where we hunger, may that hunger be satisfied by only Jesus this morning. May we see it clearly. Open our eyes, do whatever you need to do to get us to that point so that we can trust you with our lives, with our souls, with our eternities. Help us, God. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.